we're going to make it through the first day. So I'm going to uh, give a talk here about um, customer support and IOM. And um, some of the topics in my conference, uh, the conversation today, I'm going to introduce um, our users and applications and give a somewhat chronological discussion of what's for at after the lab. Talk about um, some of the events and aspects of Lustre which have impacted the usability. A few things about our support strategy and concluding with our, our latest and greatest success story on the IO side. So my um, my role in the Lester project is sort of twofold. And, and one in, is to provide to act as sort of a proxy for our end user community back to our local Lester project and to CFS and Sun. And the other role is um, Basically, as a use uh, consultant, um, just a little background: uh, the nature of our uh, applications is multidisciplinary scientific and engineering research. So we've got big 3D nonlinear simulation, and we have both scientists and, and computer scientists on our code teams. And so well that, that adds some complexity in the support of them. Um, we have a, a whole bunch of different um, platforms, but since um, um, our center really is in support of the ASC program, the, the current generation of the ASC system is called Purple, and it's uh, IBM proprietary AIS, about 100 teraflops, and it's actually, we're a really big GPFS customer, so we've got 100 gigabytes per second GPFS files on that, on that system. Um, we have a lot of Linux clusters. And our whole strategy with the Linux cluster started in the, in the ballpark of seven years ago. The idea there is how can we replicate the AF, the ASCII programming model, um, and uh, the platform architecture with all commodity hardware. And uh, so for us, that was the beginnings of, of um, working on Lustre. Uh, at the time, actually, uh, I don't recall, there were four technologies that really weren't available to the extent we needed them to, to uh, replicate an nasty style of Lustre. You know, the file system and the interconnect were the two big now, subsequently, we have this monster um, BDL system. And now it's got 212 992 CPUs, and it's got one IO node uh, for 64 compute nodes or 128 processes. So we have on that system uh, 1,664 lustres. Um, a little, little, uh, a little different perspective on, on what our applications are. So all our clusters are, at this time, um, we have a lot of nodes of um, modest scale, and this is up on the Linux side. Um, we, individual jobs are, are running on hundreds to thousands of processes. Um, we have, everything is uh, coordinated by MPI, and perhaps there's some shared memory com uh, communication within the node. Um, all the nodes have a parallel file system, and 
could all all nodes could be writing to the same file at the same time, or or every process could be writing to individual uh, files. And the codes are in C, C plus plus, or um, One thing we noted a while back was that the writes to the file system dominate reads by about five. And actually, interestingly, that ratio is changing. And the reason it's changing is uh, relates to now we, we do read the data, write it to archive, and then often it's read back to Lester. And so uh, once we got to the point where our parallel file system um, could be filled up, that ratio came. So I, I said we were a GPFS customer. And actually, we were one of the very first GPFS uh, sites. And prior to um, prior to having Lesser in production, we had GPFS in production for close to five years, and, and that put certain expectations on how a parallel file system would perform. Um, but there was a real different sort of uh, uh, support required. Um, that file system was totally, I mean, when, 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 it, um, when it got to our site, we tested it um, and, and then gave it the thumbs up to go into production. So actually the team involved in supporting GPFS was actually almost exclusively on the application software side and not on the system software side. Um, one of the things coming out of ASCII is one of the measures of how much bandwidth um, you need in a parallel file system is that you should be able to dump half of memory Five minutes. So as the half of the whole cluster. So as as, um, as the cluster gets big, bigger, so does so does the file system. And a, and actually another interesting thing in, in the early days uh, for us for parallel file system, we were advocating um, a, a lot different approach to writing I/O. The application, and it was basically we were strongly advocating using MPI IO and, and parallel HDFI, and we had our sort of hand presentation on, you know, here is how we envision the ASCII uh, application IO. Um, so in the project I was in at the time, we our our tasks were supporting. IIO and, and HDF5. And initially, uh, through that time, the first version of IOR and subsequently the second version of IOR. <coughs> so, our first Linux clusters, um, we did not have a parallel file system, but we still had some pretty serious IO requirements. And so, right off the bat, we had 64. That's file systems that uh, the, it was incumbent on the application programmer to figure out how to strike their data across those. Uh, interestingly, one of the, the code, and I'll talk more about DDCMD, but that, that's going to be our, our uh, success story. At that point in time, uh, that they wanted to uh, in depth after about every two minutes of simulation time, write, write several small files from each of the So, So for them, that was great, because actually 64 NFS file systems, you do have a higher uh, aggregate file creation. It's a nice thing. And you also handle very small transfers. Um, so we've got these Linux clusters. We've got the Lustre project rolling, and 
the way God, our, our management, breathing fire down our backs to get less for into production. And now this was starting months after the, the path forward uh, uh, collaboration between CFS and Trilabs. So um, we did get it into uh, production. And um, once we got it into production, the whole support strategy for the customers um, changed dramatically. So no, the, the one size fits all at the I.O. architecture was out the window, and it was like um, individual code teams that were having showstoppers. So, I mean, some uh, performance problem, some data integrity problem, you know, but, and there were some, you know, when the code was, when Lust was really under a year old. Um, so um, we, our uh, our support strategy evolved to like a, you know one on one remedial sort of uh, assistance to the code. Um, so we tried to document better practices, and all, occasionally the code teams took our side. Um, an another interesting thing. Probably most interesting to me at the time was uh, that I, I um, developed a survey for all the code teams uh, and it was just a program on, you know, you do a shared file process, how big are your files, how many files you write at each time step, how frequent are your time steps, that, that sort of thing. The real eye opener for me how different uh, the usage was than what we had been promoting. And actually, another great thing about it was uh, it, it allowed me to get to know the code teams individually. Um, so, um, as Mark talked a little bit about earlier, uh, initially we had a dedicated file system for each cluster. And at, at that time, the lesson team was mostly involved in, in fighting fires. Um, so this, you know, now I'm thinking we're about a year into production. And some of the frustra customer frustrations are that the luster robustness wasn't close to what DPFS was. And today that gap is pretty small. Um, our, our code teams are still not comfortable with the possibility that they'll get a short read or short write, and that's an acceptable behavior under POSIX that they ought to be checking their return codes and, and doing their own. Uh, error recovery for that situation. And um, GPFS has a, a, a basically its striking is automatic and depending upon the file size, whereas the cluster, um, um, you have to manually, I call it manually, you have to determine the striping characteristics prior to, and um, say that, you know, you can tell them about it. If it gets into their run scripts, it's probably going to move forward, but they're not going to remember it the next time you need to set the, set the file striking. So what's going to happen is, hey, how come my performance went down? So, so that's a sort of a return. Um, Annoyance for us. So BTL, the new the monster, um, this would have been, I think we've had it over two years now. So new 
hardware uh, that has its own unique and bizarre architecture. Um, we we uh, Mark talked about having a cluster just for data offload. Um, and um, pretty much at, at the BPL scale, all the middleware is broken. None of it works. In fact, I would say, like, my experiences with, with those multi-free libraries is that they probably were tuned um, at, at the level of 100 um, clients. And not a whole lot of, so almost, you know, more than five years, so there was no uh, tuning with regard to scaling. And the thing about BPL, some of these customers, they still want to create a file for a file more for process. Uh, so now, at that point in time, it could be 132 pay processes. And um, 128 pay processes. So um, the DBC MD team, at the time, if you recall, they wanted to do the simulation <laughs> and then write what a couple of files from every project. Well, it's actually their initial runs on DDL. The file creation was the bottleneck of their entire process. So, so for two minutes of simulation, they had more than two minutes of file creation to do that. And so we we had another meeting with them, and the, what came out of that that was sharing files at a lower now, by sharing, um, you can share files in a couple of ways. You could have multiple processes opening and accessing the file, but that actually doesn't solve your metadata problem. So, so here what I mean by sharing the files is there's a, an aggregation step in, in, by communication um, prior to writing this smaller number. So um, moving forward to say a year ago when we were um, pretty far down the road with uh, multi-cluster files, you know, one of the things is in the big picture we have not yet achieved acceptable stability for the customers. Both we were moving forward to the multi-cluster um, uh, file system. <laughs> and we're, we're adding a new series of our telecom clusters, six new, bigger, better clusters to our existing four, and, and adding more storage. At that time, we had, at first, we had three file systems on each network, and now, now we're at two. So we saw a new wave of problems to support. And I would say um, many were contention related. BPL actually you can still do it. I mean, you can basically wipe out. Uh, it, it, it can uh, so overwhelm the big, even the big file systems that we have attached to it that uh, that no other clusters have real access. And um, the other thing that's a little more subtle um, now is difficult to, to identify and localize the source of the performance problem. So when BPL had its own personal file system, the way we run it, I mean when that when that file system was having a problem, we could go down a short list of, of codes that we're running on. And it might just be one code and identify the problem. Um, now we've sort of uh, broadened the, the scope that we So um, I'm gonna um, before I go into talking about the, the uh, our big success story, I want to tell you about sort of a, a this is when when problems come to me that I can apply this approach. I, I'm really happy about it. Um, one of the things actually, and, and, and I. I wonder if other people um, have encountered this sort of thing. Like prior to working on IS, <laughs> I worked on more of the simulation side of, of, of HPC for about 10 years. And when I, 
would talk to a code team and say, well, what is your code doing and how does it perform? I really got some really good guidance as, as to um, you know, their algorithms, their optimization, how well it, how efficient it was. Um, most of the time when I, I uh, talk to a, a code team, sometimes, not always, they know what's going on, but, but often they'll say, oh yeah, you know, I know everything about this ILS invention, the this, 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 and this, you know, we're not, we're not causing the problem, it is in our code. Um, but surprisingly, they really don't understand what their ILS do. Um, and uh, so, one of the things I find incredibly valuable is to, you know, well, backing up a bit, I mentioned it can be difficult to identify who's the problem. Uh, we're getting a little bit of ex experience on how to do that manually. Um, but, um, uh, so say we can identify the code. And now what we'd like to do is, is verify the problem, get a test tape, or, or watch it you know, with um, and uh, if, if that impact of that problem, if there's broad impact, we can ask them nicely not to run it anymore. <laughs> or, or, or to tell us when they're running that. And, and so, um, um, anyway, so next step is uh, we found that guy. Uh, what I like to do, I do a system trace and basically get all the traces, uh, look at them. The kind of things I'm looking at are this, the file sizes, um, whether it's shared file or file for process. And looking at, you can merge the traces and see if, uh, if there can be stalling. <laughs> so, you, so it's, um, there's a wealth of information there. And so, right now, for me, I, I, I prefer not to talk to them about what they think their IO is doing. I, I say, just give me a test case, let me go file it, let me talk to you about what I do. Um, in, in a number of situations, we're, we're able to map the, those conditions that we um, determine from the tracing onto our favorite test code that I log. And or or sometimes we actually need to write a small kernel to try to reproduce that behavior. But often with IOR, and often we can then uh, uh, submit a bugzilla with the log. A lot of times our, our we have a lot of problem handing off uh, a real application in many situations. So, um, the general comments, and, and um, I think I've touched on all of these. Um, one of the things, that actually, when we've been able to identify that a customer was having a problem and go to them proactively, uh, it was a huge help. Um, and if there, if you have any ideas on, on how we can, um, Improve that process of identifying, uh, identifying and localizing the problem. That is, that is um, You know, we we have at, at this point in time, we're um, we're not promoting the parallel IO at all. And so I, I'm pleased to see some of that um, the optimization efforts in the way. And then I talked about. So let's go on now to um, a team we've been working with for about four years. Um, um, and, and I've mentioned them a, a few times before. Uh, so initially they were creating a 
home by summer. Um, <coughs> Dave Richards and I were talking, and he asked, he, he got a question and a statement. And the question was, what can I do in my application to get the same performance you get when you do your maximum And just as his uh, comment, well, for the project we have, we need a comprehensive life cycle plan. Okay. Um, so let's, let's get into uh, just a little bit. Um, that gives a little background on what BBC and B is. And there's a lot of um, a lot of amazing things done with that. But, but we'll just focus on the I.O. ones for right now. And what, what, it's, what they're studying is called the Kelvin Helmholtz with an L, two L, instability. Uh, and, and this is a picture of a simulation. And you basically have two, two liquids and a shear force, and there's turbulence generated. Um, One of the things, actually, <coughs> um, one of the things about it, that I, I actually had a background in the computational mechanics. So, one of the coolest things, this is really one of the coolest calculations. It's a, a, a atomistic calculation that predicts a macroscopic, a macroscopically observable uh, physical process. So the, those uh, the, the turbulence is actually you know is macroscopic. So here's some of the notes that um, in, in this lifestyle. Uh, life cycle plan uh, data. So you've got an initial estimate of the data requirements and, and uh, planning upon a restart interval in the range of two to three hours and calculating out that their data rate is about 1.6 terabytes per hour. And so if, if they Three hour restart interval and could achieve 10 gigabytes per second, then um, that would be 5% of their wall clock. And so that, that was what the target was. Um, so when we started, uh, it was writing at 2 gigabytes per second. Um, and that was, wasn't, uh, wasn't going to be acceptable. Why later on that? But um, at the time, you'll recall they were aggregating to about 100 files, and so they uh, re and re rescaled things so they're ag aggregating to 1,664 files, one file per I/O node, um, and and made sure using a mapping uh, capability in detail that they were, you know, you didn't land with two files in one item. They mapped it explicitly so there'd be one file associated with the other <coughs> item. Um, well, uh, on the operational side, um, how, how are we going to achieve that? So there were a couple of suggestions. One was basically to dedicate a file system. And the second was that they could use both file systems and, and write in parallel to both of them. And so our answer was, uh, and, and our, part of our considerations too, was how does the rest of the computer center stay in operation while they're just doing this calculation? So one of the file systems was dedicated to the team, and we did not have them Um, 
They also, to conclude that bad data life cycle strategy, uh, they were planning on how to stream their data off to the archive. And using the, when they carried out that calculation, it, it was going to be fairly straightforward to get their data off. There was plenty of data that was stored. So it all worked. And actually, it worked better than we thought it would. Because when they asked what was the, um, when they asked for our advice on what, what they could achieve uh, in terms of throughput, we thought that there was no way they could exceed 10, and we were more comfortable with them for shooting for 6 gigabytes per second. But they actually, um, were able to achieve 18 gigabytes per second. And so, um, we don't know of a real application that does better. Um, so that, there's a picture of the, the BBC and B e team um, winning the Gordon Bell uh, Award. And, and it, it was crucial to them to have that performance uh, on their I.O. so that they could have the, the uh, aggregate throughput on that application. So, um, so I concluded here with the discussion of this heroic effort, but I, I, you know, it wasn't only an I.O. thing. There, there were similar heroic efforts on the algorithm including some, some fault tolerance um, to hardware errors built into the application. And it was the biggest, uh, probably the biggest single uh, job put up in the aggregate for our archive system. And the visualization was also a huge effort. Um, so from the, from the uh, from the Luster team perspective, um, you know, we've had a long working relationship with this code team. But in the end, we, we were caught trying to support our everyday uh, requirements and these extreme requirements and managed to pull it off. And so, um, in conclusion, I'd just say both from the, the Luster team and from from our science team, that we're, we're looking forward to the next order of magnitude increase in denial. So, um, that's for that. So, any questions? Say in this calendar year, um, we've had uh, we've had one um, code that has knocked us out uh, a couple of times until we uh, assembled our biggest system administrators and went and met with them in person. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's not kidding, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I would say it's, it's uh, you know, in the last six months, that's the only one I can think of. I mean, I can't remember. That, they're running out of my notes. Oh, oh, yeah, that one. Well, that's not running. Uh, <laughs> but, but we've actually got another interesting uh, problem um, that for customer support lately is that uh, we've run out of inodes on a compound. And, and it's almost, uh, you know, I mean, these guys think they're unlimited. You know? so, uh, <laughs> so, so that, that, and that was a, uh, actually a particular challenge determining who was the culprit, and, and then cleaning that up. Uh, <laughs> 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 
I'll say that was you, sir, so didn't do anything all the time. I didn't do anything all the time. So I'm lying, but not all the time. So besides the application of half to system administrators, what do you think from a, a system software perspective would help ease any of the littleness of the system that you have today? Uh, you know, the one thing I actually, I mean, I think what, I think we've got in place a pretty good process once we identify the user. Uh, so, I mean, maybe this sort of biases to make in my life but if, if, if it was easier to identify who was causing a problem, uh, whether it was, you know, they consumed all the I know, or it was that they were assaulting the file system with you know, 30 byte writes uh, from BPL on every node, uh, you know, identify them. That, that would be where I. Incredible convenience compared to having a lot of 